Hello, I'm Dennis Tucker, and I want to welcome you to another lesson. Uh, this will be preached at Lyak Road on Sunday night, January 17th. But for those who maybe cannot be with us or those who are interested in the subject matter, then I'm going to record this so that we can you can watch it at your convenience. And I'm, again, Dennis Tucker, and preach with Lyak Road Church of Christ, Litchville, Kentucky. But I got thinking a while back about certain phrases that are used or have really quit being used and a lot of times because things change technology changes let me give you a couple examples of this one talking about uh one is a shade tree mechanic okay now now probably like if you're the age of our, our son about 32 then uh you look at that and you think uh what does that mean but growing up that was a phrase i was used quite a bit and I was referring to maybe a guy down the street or a guy uh, on the next hill or someplace over here. And he would work on cars. And he'd go to his house and maybe he was full-time mechanic. Well, maybe he wasn't. But he'd drive up and maybe literally that he would have a toolbox underneath a shade tree. And that shade tree would have uh, maybe a jack there so he could jack up the car or maybe a pulley where he could lift up the motor if it need be. And he'd come to go to him, and he would uh, ask you what's wrong with the car, and you would kind of tell him whether it was running rough, or you kind of describe what it'd be. And he listened a little bit to it, and then uh, he would uh, start working on it. And that was a shade tree mechanic. Now, sometimes it's kind of figurative that he may have a garage that, that he would actually work at. After all, he could only work in the shade tree uh, during the summertime months and not during the wintertime. But this guy here was basically a guy that worked on autos. And that wasn't like your Ford dealer or your Chevrolet dealer like that. Now, of course, we don't have that much today. And the reason is, I assume, because most vehicles are very complicated. That They have the computers now. All the new vehicles are computer operated. They have all these computer systems to it. And you really can't have a computer system to diagnose it underneath the shade tree. And in fact, most of the time, they hook up the computer to the car and the, the computer tell them what's wrong with the car. Uh, but that phrase, shade tree mechanic, is not used very much anymore and I understand why. The, none of it is uh, the idea of tuning in. Sometimes I use that when referring to the the uh, videos that I perform for uh, YouTube. I'll thank people for tuning in uh, to the program. They may wonder, where, where, where does that come from? What does that really mean? Well, again, I, I think perhaps there's a little bit more, you know, you know where people can uh, kind of uh, understand this a little more. Maybe they've done it more. And that is, that used to be with your television and radio, you didn't have the, the dig, uh, digital system we have today. But instead, you actually had a knob on the radio and you would have to turn it little by little. And then you start hearing the program, maybe a little bit kind of staticky, and then it gets stronger, stronger. And then you go a too far and start getting weaker again. So you tune it back to the right place where that signal will be the best. And uh, and the same thing for television. Uh, that If you had, well, I grew up at Louisville, Kentucky, we had Channel 32. Now, the knob on TV only went from 2 to 13. So Channel 32 was your UHF. And you had to turn it there to UHF. And then you had to fine-tune it again to get that station just right. And so that phrase here, tuning in, refers to that idea there. Well, a lot of words or phrases not used very much anymore is the word sin. And sin, and in fact, you don't hear that said a whole lot. And I realize that probably going back 20, 30, 40 years ago on television, uh, even in politics, you didn't hear the word sin used much anymore. But in preaching, in pulpits, and, and maybe in daily conversation, it was used quite a bit in times past but today you don't hear the word sin uh, spoke about much anymore especially in relationship to god and what sin does to us and the problem is you see if we forget what sin means if we under do not understand what sin is and we don't accept the idea of god's existence we don't even understand that sin exists then as far as that goes and so our understanding of right and wrong is right connected with our understanding of god and his righteousness and what sin is and so as i that's, i want to kind of talk about that some and i realize some people may even say that use the word sin as a harmful phrase as a harmful word to use that it, it has bad connotations 
Well, we have to understand what sin is, really understand the greatness of Christ, uh, of Christ's sacrifice and why we need to stay out of it. And so we want to talk about sin, the kind of defining sin in this lesson here, if you would. And so one thing about sin, I think we have to understand some misconceptions about sin, and about three of them in particular, four of them even. And one is the, the idea that sin is determined by the norms of society. Now, now, society, therefore, really defines what sin is. And when you violate those cultural norms, then you have sinned. But until you do that, then you really haven't sinned. Now, what this does is, of course, it makes sin simply a product of what society accepts and what society doesn't accept. And uh, as you think about that, one time, that may not have been that dangerous of an assumption, because at one time, a lot of things society defined it as sin was defined by sin in the Bible, and that they sometimes coexisted, that society and the Bible said this is sinful. But what we're seeing is less and less is defined by sin today, and from the Bible, as far as people's viewpoint of it, as society tends to look more and more lean on things that used to be defined as sin. Uh, let me give you an example that maybe you had a couple uh, that they're living together. They're not married together, uh, but they're living together. And used to be people would even say they're living in sin. And what it meaning that they're living together, have a sexual relationship with each other, but they're not actually married. But now today in society, there are a lot of people that just use marriage as a piece of paper anyway, and that marriage is uh, something that's man-made, how they look at it. And a lot of people today are living in, without benefit of marriage. And society tends to say, okay, about that. I mean, very few people today in our society would really say, that's bad. Or maybe the idea of lying. Uh, lying now is called a lot of different things. It's uh, withholding the truth. It is... Uh, I may, may not be totally honest with the people, but the lying today is a lot of times just kind of viewpoint that's why it's really not a big deal. Or stealing. Uh, stealing can be called a lot of different things. It's borrowing uh, permanently. Maybe it's a phrase some people use. But stealing. And so uh, society tends to look upon a lot of those things as okay today. And so in people's minds, then that is no longer sinful. That's a misconception. Sin is not defined by society. Another one is that sin is not real. And that sin really is not real. It's a product of man's mind, and specifically the product of religious people. And this is the humanist, that they would say that if you get rid of God, that God's existence, then you see, you get rid of the Bible, and then you get rid of sin because they're all three tied in together. And again, the humanists will say that the illusion of God is harmful. The reason why they say that is because when they look at the Bible, when they understand that I believe in God, it means there are certain things that are morally right, morally wrong, and they don't like that. And so in those folks' point of view, is that sin is really simply a non-existent thing. Let's just forget that sin exists. Another one is that defining sin is really simply having a negative attitude. It's having a bad attitude about things. And, uh, and maybe some people want to say, well, it's letting yourself down. Yes, when you really sin, when you've not been the best that you expect yourself to be. And so the, the solution to that is to simply to have a better positive mental attitude. Simply go out there and you know, whether or not you go out and get drunk, have a good attitude about it. We have premarital sex, have a good attitude about it. If you view pornography, have a good attitude about it. And it's okay. As long as you're comfortable with it, with it and you don't think it's really as bad, then it's okay. And so those three things in particular is what how some misconceptions that people have of sin. Well, we have to let the Bible define sin. And there's a lot of different words that are connected with sin in the Bible. And we're just going to kind of go through a list of those words. For instance, sin is, in certain passages, defined to mean to fail to hit the mark. To miss the mark. And basically, it's one away from the law of God. An illustration that may be, and pretend like you're throwing darts, or maybe you are an uh, archer, a shooting bow and arrow, and you have a target up there on the wall, and you are throwing at it, and you don't hit the bullseye, you have missed the mark. And therefore, what, that, what the Bible says is, you have not hit the mark. That's when you have sinned. And that idea is used 172 times in the New Testament. And generally, the New Testament is used referring to the condition of the heart. 
that causes men to violate the very character and standard of God, that we don't actually keep the law of God. And we might call this in some way stinking thinking, that we do not have the right attitude, we don't have the right heart. And the Bible says that there's a progression, and that is from the heart, the mind of man, and then it, it, it changes the way the man thinks, and then the way the man works and acts. And so that's one idea about sin, and that's in a sense there. And the Bible says that everybody has missed the mark, Jews and Gentiles both. If you look at Romans 3, verse 9, it said, What then? Are we better than they? In other words, Paul had just laid out in Romans 1, the Gentiles have sinned against God. In chapter 2, the Jews have sinned against God. So chapter 3 ties them all again together. And said, so are we better than they? Are the Jews better than the Gentiles? No, not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all in their sin, that they have all violated the God's law. And so therefore, sin can only be understood in relationship to God's law. And that is, that's the standard. That's the mark we're trying to hit, is the law of God to keep it perfectly. And when we don't do that, then we have sinned against God. If you go to Romans 7, and read me verses 11 through verse 13. And there Paul said, For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it killed me. Therefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. In other words, God's law is not a problem of saying that God's law is bad. But he said, that's a holy law. That's a good law. What happened? Well, he said, we have, we have missed the mark. We haven't kept it. And therefore, verse 13 said, has then what is good become death of me? Certainly not. But sin, that in my appear sin was producing death of me through what is good, so that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. That God's law defines sin, tells us what sin was, and, and says, you do this, you have sinned against God, and here's the punishment of it. But again, it's saying the, the law itself is good. It's simply us missing the mark. And so we look, look at that and realize that adultery is wrong, not because society says so, but because God says so. And uh, the, the same goes for homosexuality. That is wrong, not because society said it was wrong in times past, but because God says so. Stealing and murder and lying, all those things were wrong because, not because society did. In fact, in the time of Paul's writing here, that society, the Roman uh, Gentile society, accepted a lot of those things. But it's wrong because it violated the very law of God. And the Bible also points out that Jesus did not sin. His heart was right with God. And his conduct is, was right. His obedience was right to God. And therefore, he never sinned against God. Hebrews 4, verse 17. For we though do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet with us our sin. And so sin is missing the mark. It is, it's missing the mark in attitude. It's missing the mark in thought. It's missing the mark in intention. It's missing, missing the mark in conduct. Then also, sin is an unwillingness to hear or not hearing properly. Is also, and that kind of a word for sin is used three times in the New Testament. And it really is a disobedience because refusing to listen to God and hear what God said. If you go to Romans 5, verse 18, it said, Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. And so through one man's righteous act, the free gift uh, came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, men were made sinners, so as by one man's obedience, men will be made righteous. Who's that one man he's talking about? He's talking about Adam. And that Adam and Eve, now Adam and Eve heard the word of God, but they did not pay attention to it. They did not actually do what God said to them. In our vernacular day, we may say somebody, we're talking to somebody, we may actually stop and say, are you listening to me? Do you hear what I'm saying? And what, we're, what we realize, that person really is not paying attention to what we're saying to them. And so it's a refusal to hear what God says is the idea of sin right there. In 2 Corinthians 10 verse 4, it says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, for pointing on strongholds, cast down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Everything else we hear that proclaims something superior to God, that is sin right there. Refusal to listen to God. 
And he said, bring about every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being made, uh, being ready to punish all disobedience when you, your obedience is fulfilled. And so there's the idea that, that people simply refuse to hear the word of God. In the Bible, we find phrases such as they become dull hearing. And what that means is they really weren't listening to what God was saying. And so that's the idea here um, of simply a dull of hearing. And so there's times in the Bible the writers or the speakers will say, are you listening? In Hebrews 2 verse 1, it said, Therefore we must give them our earnest heed to things we have heard, lest we drift away. What's, what's that mean? We may pay attention to what we're hearing. Pay attention to the word of God. For that if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast and their transgressed this being received a just reward. People in the Old Testament, people in times past, when they didn't listen to God, they were punished because of their disobedience. And yet the point Hebrew writers making that Jesus is Son of God, we may we must listen to him even more intently. Another idea of sin expressed in the Bible is the state of non-compliance. And these some, uh, there's overlap in these terms here, I realize that. But it's that the intentional action, the idea of rebelling against God is really the idea of sin right there. And it's described in various ways in the Bible. In Romans 2 verse 8, it said, But those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath. And this here is, again, a case where a person may hear the word of God. And they simply decide that they don't care. You know, there's times somebody may say, I, I know it may be wrong, but I'm going to go ahead and do it. In that case, there's nothing else you can say to them, nothing else that you can do to change their mind. They have already heard what needs to be done. They already know what sin is. That's just wrong to do this, but they've already decided to do it anyway. And in that case, sir, that's the idea state of simply being non-compliant. And some Jews and Gentiles heard the word of God and they refused to believe. And so that's one other idea of sin, assembly, the conscious decision of I'm not going to do what God says to do. Then there's another uh, definition of sin. And again, uh, we're just kind of going through those in this lesson. But it means to neglect or pass by to omit. And usually it's translated as the word pass, for instance. And, and, and Luke 11, verse 42. Luke 11, verse 42 said, But woe to you Pharisees. For you tie the mint and rue and all manner of herbs and pass by justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. And, and what he meant is they simply didn't do it. This would ought to be defined as a sense of omission. That is, the Bible said to do this please God, and we simply did not do that. James 4 verse 17 addresses this. And there it says, therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it to him is sin. The person who knows to do good, the person that says, uh, I, know, I know God says do this, but you know what? I'm just going to not do it. I don't feel an obligation to do this. And so he's not doing what he should do. And really, we cannot pick and choose our passages. We cannot say, well, I like this passage. I'll do it. And I don't like that passage or that command. I'll, I won't do that. And we don't, we don't we don't have the right to pick and choose our pastures. And so that's a sin of omission. And then the next definition is going aside, overstepping, transgressing, or breaching the law. And this is sins of commission, where we transgress the word of God. Judas is defined in Acts 1 verse 25 as by, he fell by transgression. Was I mean, he did not just deny Jesus. He, he betrayed Jesus. He, he sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. He, he went out softly you know, for the occasion, opportunity to do that. And so he, by transgression, Eve fell into transgression. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 14. That the apple just didn't fall in her hand. Excuse me, the fruit. Didn't just fall in her hand. That she had to go and pick it up and put it in her mouth and chew on it to have it. You see, there's an a, a, a act of transgression. And so again, it's a failure to keep the standard of God. But in this case here, we have done so intentionally. We have transgressed the word of God. In Galatians 3 verse 19, he said, What purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions. 
till the sea should come to him the promise made, and it was pointed through angels by the head of a mediator. And that is, the law defines what sin is and what's, what we need to stay away from. And when we go ahead and do that, which is sinful, then we have transgressed the law. So that's an active action on that part, where the other sin was we simply don't do anything. Then also, another definition is the lack of reverence towards God. A lack of respect for God. It's really the disregard of God to have a kind of a defiant attitude about him. To show disrespect and, and basically have kind of an ungodly attitude towards him. Uh, easily seen today when people would say, use the name of God in vain. Or maybe, the, I always remember a number of years ago on a certain TV show that uh, somebody was talking about. It. The show was Cheers and you had Norm. And you had uh, somebody else and I, I forgot what the other character's name was. But, but one always was in a stool and he one time he mentioned that if he came in and God himself was in his chair, he would tell him to get out. Well, you know, that's that's not having reverence towards God. First of all, God wouldn't be in his chair. But second of all, that's just a bad attitude about God. I saw a sign a while back that uh, about California basically said, keep God out of California. Well, that's a, a, a re irreverent attitude towards God. And so it's that attitude of defiance, attitude of disrespecting God. Titus 2 verse 12 says, teaching us that denying ungodliness and world lust we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. That denying uh, ungodliness. And that's what we're talking about. The ungodly attitude people have. Uh, thinking of common in a common, ordinary way. And thinking, I'm going to treat God like I treat my neighbor. God is not your neighbor. We need to have a better attitude towards God. Another definition means to be unruly. To refuse to put oneself in subjection to God's law is the idea there. And it's mentioned in 1 Timothy 1 verse 9. There is a knowing this, that the law is not made for the righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers, murderers of mothers, for manslayers. And so again, this would be that kind of person says, you know what, I refuse to subject myself to God's word. I'm going to do what I want to do. And God himself cannot make me do that. That's the attitude right there. I don't care what the Bible says. That's sin. Then another one is condition being without law. That is as if that one can act without the law and be okay. That we don't need the Bible to approve of something or to tell us we can do something. It's simply the idea that I'll, I assume it's okay. And I don't really need the law. Well, again, that's talked about in the Bible. And Matthew 12, 7, verse 21. Starting there, it said, Not everyone says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he does will my Father in heaven. Men will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name. And then I would declare to them, I never knew you. Pardon me, you practice lawlessness. Now that last phrase there, lawlessness. What he's saying is you have done that which was not approved by the word of God, without authority from God. And again, this would be seen with a person where you ask them, okay, where's the Bible passage that says you can do this? And they say, I don't know. I don't care. I just assume it's okay. Well, you know, that is doing something without the authority. And that is lawlessness. And then another definition is a deed violating justice, law, and righteousness. Now, again, these are often overlapping ideas. But we look on 1 John 5, verse 17, it says, All unrighteousness is sin, and there is sin not leading to death. Now, all unrighteousness is sin. And that means it's simply violating justice and the law. And this may be included in the phrase when you read the Bible, it gives a list of sins to say, and such like. In other words, not every sin is mentioned by name in the Bible, but it's those that have the same principles involved, and that is, it violates the system of justice and of being righteous. And so we again, an example of that would be abortion. Somebody may say, show me the Bible where it says abortion is wrong, while well, I can show you the Bible where murder is wrong. I can show you the Bible where taking the life of an innocent person is wrong, and who could be more innocent than the unborn baby? And so that's the idea there. And then finally, anything done which one doubts is the right thing to do. 
that it points out that sin is sometimes connected to our sense of conscience. Uh, in Romans 14, verse 23, it says, He who doubts is condemned if he eats because it does not eat from faith. For whatever is not from faith is sin. Now, what he means by that is that our behavior need to be consistent with what we understand sin to be. If, if I think this is sin, and I go ahead and commit that, do that, which I think is really not okay with God, that's really not according to God's word, then I have sinned against God. Now, it may be a case that actually my conscience may be wrong about that. But if I have a conscience that says I shouldn't do this, and I do it anyway, I have sinned. Now, it may be a case I need to be taught better. I need to spend some more time in the Bible, find out whether that, not that thing is sinful, actually, really or not. But it's by the violating of my conscience because I think that thing is wrong and I do it anyway, then I have sinned against God. An example of that. Let's say I go to a lectureship and there is a table here with all kinds of items on it. And I see some things there and I think it's for sale, that they're selling these things. And I pick up one and just kind of sneak it into my coat pocket and walk away without paying for it. Now, I may not have seen a sign that actually says everything's free. I don't realize it's free, but I, I've gone ahead and taken something thinking that I'm stealing it. Now, although it was actually intended to be free, I've done something wrong. I've sinned because I've violated what I know to be wrong. I know, I know stealing is wrong. So that'd be an example of sin in that case there. And so it's a violation of doing something uh, that we know we shouldn't be doing. And so this, now again, being sincere by itself doesn't make one right. And, and my conscience may be clear, but if Bible said this is wrong, still wrong. But in this case here, it's actually violating my conscience is what sin is. But the cause of sin is not going by God's will, but instead by what we want to do. In one way or form or another, when one does not trust God, when not, one does not respect God, when one does not commit himself to God, then he sins against God. And he finds it easier to sin against God. But always what Bob points out is that the wages of sin is death. And again, we have to understand what sin is and understand the terribleness of it. So as to abhor it and not try to get close to it, not get involved in it, but also to understand the greatness of Jesus' sacrifice for us. He died because sin is that bad and he loves us so much that he wants us to be able to go to heaven. And so we need to think about what is the Bible says I need to do to go to heaven and to be, be, be obedient to it. Obey the word of God. I appreciate you watching the program. And I would uh, invite you to come be with us at Lionic Road Church Christ. Our building is located at 1687 Lionic Road, Litchfield, Kentucky. And if you can, our services are Sunday morning, 930 Bible class, 1025 worship. And then on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. we have Bible class again. But also, I'd like to study with you. If you want to sit down and study or maybe study by Zoom or some other means of studying, or if you have a question and want to write that down and send it to me, then feel free to do that. And, uh, and I'll be glad to spend some time answering your questions. But I do appreciate you watching the program. I hope that you will feel free to share this if you enjoy the lesson, if you want to be educational, helpful, biblical. And also, hit the like button to let uh, let us know that you watch. I appreciate you watching. I hope you have a good day.